Take your Bible, turn to Numbers 21, and um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll make mention of a couple things after we read the scripture. Numbers chapter 21, I have it up on the screen, we'll start in verse 5, and like I said, there was something that uh, my mom sent me today, I I want to go get my phone and read the story, but there's, I want to keep some names out of it. It's bad. It is one of the worst things I've heard happen in a church. And I'm sure I haven't heard it all. Numbers chapter 21, verse 5. The people spake against God and against Moses. Now, who's Moses? Moses is the lawgiver. He's a type of Christ. He is also the one who brings the word of God to the people. So he represents that. They spoke out against God, spoke against Moses, God's man. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water. And you can ask that question. Why did God lead them to a place where there's no bread, and no water? To teach them to depend on God. When God takes things away from us and we don't like it and we get mad, Maybe that's God teaching us to rely on him because we're not doing it. I know me. And I know that when things are well, I don't rely on God the way I should. It isn't until things start crumbling, things start happening, things build up. And that's when I start praying. That's when I get in the scripture more. So I need that. Uh, anyway, no bread, no water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. And I think he used the word soul for a reason. This was not just the physical needs that they were complaining about. Their soul was against God. Their soul was contrary to God and how God was leading them. So that's why it says our soul loatheth this light bread, because it's referring to the manna, the word of God. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people. And much people of Israel died. And I want you to think about that poison, and what it causes. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. They confessed their sins. They knew what they were guilty of. They didn't try to hide it. They didn't try to back away from it like Saul did. If you go back and read that story where Samuel confronted Saul about his sin, Saul insisted at least two times and maybe three. And I have to go back and look at it. But at least two times, Saul lied through his teeth when Samuel said, you didn't do what God said. I did too do what God said. At least twice he resisted confessing his sin. And then after that, God told Samuel, tell him, forget it. I'm not going to forgive him anymore. And God took his mercy away from him that day. So they bit the people and much people of Israel died. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord because Moses is the mediator. He is like Christ. He stands between the people and God that he take away the serpents from us. Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. You remember John 3, uh, 14, For as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And I looked at that verse one time, knowing what it was referring to here, and I said, God... Are you saying that Christ is Satan? I don't get it. Then you read in Colossians that all of the symbolism of, of the cross, um, the stripes they put on his back, the thorns that they crowned his head with, the fact that they had, they had stripped him and he bore our shame because he was naked on the cross. He bore our shame. Um, all of those things represented our enemies. Jesus taking on the things that are against us, all of our enemies against whom we fight, taking them upon himself, making a show of them openly so that um, he could take them with him when he died on the cross. So that when he died, they were destroyed. 
And so that's what that represents. Let's go to prayer. Father, there is a church right now that my heart aches for. For what they're going through, what they're dealing with, what they're facing. And Father, I love your people. I don't care who they are, where they are. I love your people. And there's a chance, Father, that I might even know some of the people at this church. And my heart aches. I was sick over it. And I pray, dear God, that you would help this church. They need it. They need strong leadership. They need grace. They need revival. They were led astray. They were fooled. And I pray, dear God, Father, that you would have mercy on this church. God, that you would help them. That you give them grace. Father, if there is a greater sin problem in that church, I pray, dear God, that you deal with it. And let what happened be a sign to those who may have gone astray from you. That you're serious about sin. You're serious about the times we live in. And I pray, dear God, that you'd bless them and help them. Bless this church. Lest we fall astray. Lest we become like other churches. Father, I pray, dear God, that you would help us. Help us to remain faithful, true. Help each one of us, Father, fight the good fight to keep the faith, to stand fast, to learn how to fight the devil, to learn how to fight off even our own flesh and our own sins. Father, teach us that battle. Give us the strength and help us, dear God, that we be not a stumbling block to this world. Already so many churches falling away and the world just looks and mocks and laughs and accuses all of us for being hypocrites. And Father, I pray, dear God, that you would help us in our church, each one of our people, to be faithful, to be true, sanctify us, clear us, Father, clean sin out of our lives, and help us to stand for you always. Father, we ask your blessings on your word tonight. Bless these people, bless those that are sick, who need comfort. Be with all of our widows, all of our families. We love you and we ask for your blessings now in our ministries in Kenya and the rest of the world. Father, that we could bring a blessing to people's lives and not reproach. Thank you, Father. We ask you in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. That picture I showed you this morning, I believe it's, I believe it's an actual issue. What that's from is Stephen Greer made a documentary film called Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind, and he actively leads people to go out and do this Hindu meditation. In fact, he, I know him well enough to know that he combines different religious activities and different religious things into what he believes are going to be the saviors of this world in contacting them. But as soon as I, I, I bought the documentary, downloaded it from iTunes, and as soon as I saw that, I knew exactly what it was. And I want you to turn in your Bible to Deuteronomy chapter 32. Um, it mentions, <clears throat> we, we read there in Numbers, that the people were bitten by these serpents, and they were poisoned with some spiritual poison and died. It killed them. Uh, I would assume that all of those people that died went to hell um, because of the nature. They rejected God. They rejected Moses. They complained about the manna, how God fed them. And God turned them over to a reprobate mind and sent the serpents in. The rest of the people who did not, who may have been bitten but hadn't died yet, they learned a valuable lesson from watching these people die. If you remember, God had done this before. When Korah, Moses' first cousin, when he went up against Moses, 
saying, Are you, you think you're the only one that can hear from God? We're all God's people and, and tried to rebel against him, him and 250 other people. Moses said, he was very meek about it. He said, we'll let God decide who's going to lead his people. If God kills me, then it obviously is you. But if God does a new thing and the ground opens up and swallows you whole, then we'll know. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. The earth opened her mouth, swallowed up Korah, 250 others. And the rest of the children of Israel immediately had revival. Amen. Moses, we're on your side. Bless, bless brother Moses. It scared them. God will do things like that. I have, over the years, I've, I guess I've done it all my life. I've watched pastors since I was a boy, learning from them. I could, I guess God was preparing me for ministry even before I knew I was called. But I watched pastors do well, and I watched and heard about pastors that went astray. And that had a profound impact on me. And God has warned me many, many, many times through what he's done to other pastors that have turned bad. And I make it a regular prayer, God, don't let that be me. And uh, God's been good to me. Deuteronomy chapter 32. Um, let's see. Verse 31. And that, I'm going to read this and I'm going to tell you what I found out today. My mom called me and told me this. For their rock is not as our rock. Notice the capital R in that verse. Our rock is Christ. Paul said it was Christ. He said that rock that followed them was Christ. Even our enemies themselves being judges. And I, there's actually a double meaning to that. Our enemies know that we don't believe in the same thing they do. We don't believe the same Bible. We don't believe the same religion, same doctrine. Our enemies know that. But also, God will allow the unrighteous of this world to judge those who are supposed to be righteous. He will use them for his judgment. Look at the book of Judges and you will see over and over when Israel went back into Baal worship, serving Ashtaroth, building the groves, worshiping in the high places. God brought in the Philistines, the Moabites, the Ammonites and overcame them and put them under cruel authority for years. And then he said, verse 32, for their vine is the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. So their vine is not is as our vine. Our vine is Christ, the true vine. We are his branches, which means that we are nourished and fed from God's truth, the word of God. And when God sees a branch on that vine that does not and will not manifest fruit, he will purge it, cast it, and it'll end up in the fire. But He's making a great point here. Their vine is the vine of Sodom in the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. That's, now I'm connecting this with what we just read. The poison that poisoned those Israelites in the wilderness was the same as the, what wine comes from the vine of Sodom. And I've used this to show many times the two different manuscript lines that the Bibles come from. The King James comes from a separate line of manuscripts than the NIV, the New English Version, the Revised Standard Version, and all the new modern Bibles. They come from a completely different set of Greek manuscripts than does the King James. It is, it is obvious. It is agreed upon by everybody that the two manuscript lines do not agree with each other. The sad thing is, and I fell for this for years, that the other manuscript line was a better line because they were older manuscripts and we should trust them. And I don't even like to talk about those days, but I fell for that. So the vine of Sodom and the poison 
the wine that it produces or the fruit that it produces is going to be as the sin of Sodom. Um, in Ada, Oklahoma, and this is what really hit me because I spent three years in Oklahoma, going not just going to Bible college, but I visited several churches in and around the state of Oklahoma, Free Will Baptist churches. I went to school with some people that were from Ada, Oklahoma, and they were from probably from this church. I may have been to this church. I don't remember every place I went, um, but I sang in a group for a while, part time for the school. Uh, we formed a group on our own. We traveled to different churches. I don't remember all the churches I preached at. Don't remember all the churches I sang at. I may have been to this church. The church is called Harmony Free Will Baptist Church in Ada, Oklahoma. And you can look this up on Google if you want. Uh, but be careful. The pastor got murdered this week. His wife called. The police called 911 and said that an intruder broke in their house and killed her husband. So naturally, 911 responded to police, ambulance, found him dead in his home. They brought in the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigations, the, basically the FBI, to start investigating this because the story didn't sound right to them. And after a few days of investigating, the heat really started falling on this pastor's wife. And she voluntarily turned herself in and told the story that her and her husband, who was the pastor of the Ada Harmony Free Will Baptist Church, had been having a threesome for months. The guy, the guy, and his wife. All sharing one another. The pastor left, went on a mission trip to Mexico. And his wife and this other man planned his murder. So that when he came back, his wife gave the other guy, her husband, the pastor's gun. And he shot and killed him in that house. And all three of them were involved with each other. That's the vine of Sodom. That is the fruit that it produces. That is the poison that it brings. I don't know. I didn't know. I, I saw the name. I did not. I, I don't think I've ever met this man. Because that's the first thing I checked. Because I knew some people in Oklahoma and I checked to see if I knew this guy. I've never met him. Don't know him. But I can tell you, obviously, some things very, very wrong. In his life, his wife, I don't know, the article that I read didn't say anything about them having kids. Nothing. But here now is a church that has been absolutely destroyed. The faith of these people, if they didn't have true faith, people are going to leave that church and they'll never go into another one as long as they live. The ones who are true to the word of God and are faithful through this hardship, hopefully they'll get through this. I'm praying for the church. I'm praying for its people. The embarrassment that they had to go, that they're going through right now. They've charged the wife and this other man, first degree murder. Oklahoma has a death penalty. For first degree murder. And uh, it was premeditated because they planned it out. But I've said 
Don't be surprised anymore at what you hear that's happening in churches everywhere. Not just in America, it's happening in Kenya. And I know of a pastor right now that has been put out of his church. He's being investigated right now by the Kenya police. The devil's grip is powerful. It takes a powerful God to break that grip. And it takes healing balm to get that poison out. What does it take? Faith. A shield of faith. I would ask whether or not that pastor was even saved or not. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, Stephen Jenny sent me this. Apparently there's a TV show that one of the plot themes is about an evil alien race. They are snake-like creatures that enslave human bodies to live in. And they give great power and knowledge. The people rule as gods or the serpents rule as gods, desire to be worshipped as such. Um, everything is below them, but they need a host to survive during adulthood. And they, they sent that to me this afternoon. This, what I'm showing you and what I'm talking about, people are being indoctrinated with it. Television shows, movies, comic books, novels. Um, graphic novels, what they call comic books, you name it. People are being indoctrinated right now to be set up. Some people, and you would say, well, they're, an e they're evil, so they're portraying them as bad. I could point to you some people in this world that love evil and don't have a problem saying I love evil. It's advertisement for the devil is what it is. Now, um, I, I read this verse this morning. Let me go back. To the verses I read this morning and we'll go from there and remind ourselves with what I told you and you can probably think of other churches that have endured similar or maybe worse situations some of them in this town Job 6 for the arrows of the Almighty are within me the poison thereof drinketh up my spirit that happened this week at that church. The terrors of God do set themselves in array against me. Psalm 11, for lo, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow upon the string that they may privily shoot at the upright in heart. Whatever this man may have intended to be early on in his life and ministry, the devil destroyed it. Psalm 18, yea, he sent out his arrows and scattered them. He shot out lightnings and discomfited them. I want you to think about now this church and who's going to attend it now. That church is going to have a stigma on them for years to come. If that church survives this, who are they going, who are they going to invite to come to that church? Who would come who lives in that town? The devil shoots his arrows to try to break churches apart, fellowships apart, marriages apart, families apart. Our nation is destroyed already. We're just, we just haven't got there yet. We are such a divided nation. When I go back and look at, I told you I like to study World War II. I like that, Jr. And one thing I know about America during World War II is that you could count on everybody in this country being on the same side. Everybody was on the same side. How in the world they kept Hitler from knowing where D-Day was going to occur? How they kept him from knowing that, I don't understand. Because... In today's world, 
Hitler would have known for sure where and when and how many were coming. And he would have known about it from people in this country who would sell out their own country simply because they didn't like who was president or they didn't like a law. They would do that in a heartbeat. You have a nation that has been divided, scattered, discomfited by the arrows of Satan. Psalm 57, 4, my soul is among lions and I lie even among them that are set on fire. Think about that. Even the sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows and their tongue a sharp sword. So the enemy's around us. It's in our country. It's in our state. It's in our towns. It's in our villages. It's in our neighborhoods. It's in our homes. He's everywhere. Destroying this nation. Now, uh, turn to Deuteronomy 8. You're there in Deuteronomy 32. Turn to Deuteronomy 8. God can bring that church through this. I believe that. God could send revival, and I'm going to pray for that. Like I say, I don't, I don't know if I know anybody from that church. I knew of the church back in years gone by. My heart aches for them. And I'm going to make it a point to pray for this church. You can survive. You can get through it. You can remain faithful in a time where it is increasingly difficult to remain faithful to God. Deuteronomy 8.11 God is telling you how to do it. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes, which I command thee this day. Why did he say that? What is he talking about? He's talking about his word. You know what? I was reading something this week. In Deuteronomy chapter 4. Turn over there very quickly. A couple verses here just stand out in my heart right now. Now, therefore, hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you, for to do them that ye may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers giveth you. And just to ask, just in a general way, and a question, isn't life better when we live it God's way? Isn't, isn't life happier? Isn't it sweeter? Is it, doesn't it feel good to know that you did right and you did the right thing, even if nobody noticed it, even though no, nobody gave you a prize for it, you weren't hailed in front of the church? It just satisfies you to know that you did the right thing when it came time to do it. And living this life brings its own satisfaction that the world never understands. So he said, verse 2, you shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. There's the, the same thing there that John said at the end of the book of Revelation. Don't add a word to it and don't take anything from it. And what I know of Judaism is that modern Judaism is not built upon the Old Testament. It's built upon a commentary of a commentary of the Old Testament. Jesus was right. The Jews, by their traditions and their what they added to God's Word, had destroyed God's Word among them. That's why they rejected Jesus. They had no idea who He was. And to this day, they don't. Why? Because they added so much garbage and poison to God's word. In fact, I'll tell you this. This Stephen Greer guy who leads people into this, he practices a form of meditation called Merkaba. Merkaba is the Hebrew word for chariots used in the Old Testament. And who's he calling, Melissa? Chariots. Devil's chariots are coming down. He practices literally Jewish Kabbalah to call in these UFOs. 
And they show up, nine times out of ten, they show up there. Including this. That's what the Jews, that's the legacy that modern Judaism has left to this world. Their poison affects everybody. Now back in Deuteronomy chapter 8. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes which I command thee this day. And here's the warning. Lest when thou hast eaten and art full and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein. One of the things that I like about Kenya more than I like here. So most of the people that I've ministered to over there, or our church has ministered to over there, are very poor. You've seen the houses of the people that we feed over there. We've got it good in this country. We left church today, had a hard time finding a place to go eat because all the restaurants full of people. Plenty of food, plenty of money. Everybody's getting money from the government now. That's going to be a recurring thing. You watch and see. They're going to subtly, slowly but surely, change over the financial system of this country to basically a welfare state. People won't have to work, but they'll get money anyway. Meanwhile, you got people over in Kenya starving to death. But some of those people are the most faithful people I've ever met, and they love the Lord because they don't have anything else. And that's what God is warning. When you're full, you've built goodly houses, you're dwelling therein, verse 13, and when thy herds and thy flocks multiply and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied and all that thou hast is multiplied... Then thine heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. And it happens. It happens a lot. It's happened to me. Probably has happened to you. I'm not your judge. I'm assuming that it has. When everything's going fine, and we're full, and we're living comfortably, we forget. We forget to pray, forget to study. Forget to testify, forget to do something. Our hearts get lifted up and we forget the Lord our God. And we forgot that the reason why we have what we have is because God brought us out of slavery, out of bondage. That's where we used to be. And we forgot where we came from. From the house of bondage who led thee through that great and terrible wilderness wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions. Let me tell you what I think about this verse. Scorpions. Do you see scorpions anywhere in the book of Revelation? Where are from, John? Revelation 9. Coming up out of the pit. What about the fiery serpents? Where are they coming from? Revelation 12. Down from the heavens. Wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions. And look, look what God did. And drought where there was no water. Who brought thee forth water out of the rock of flint? Did not God keep his people safe? Did not God give them plenty to drink? Did not God feed them well? Did not God take very good care of those people? Of course he did. But when he does, after a while, we forget about what God saved us from, what God brought us out of, what God, I mentioned this morning, I think it's somewhat healthy if every now and then you go to God honestly and say, God, am I saved? I think it's healthy. I think it's a good idea to go back to God and say, God... I just want to make sure. When I was with Lee Walsh the night he died, Sister Betty's husband, he was out of his mind. Betty warned me. And she said, be careful, you go in there. He's just talking out of his head. And when I walked in that room, 
just something came over him and he became very lucid. He knew me, shook hands with me. And all of a sudden he started praying right there in that room. Well, I grabbed his hand. And we all prayed. He got done. He said, I just wanted to make sure that I know I'm going to heaven. And he died that night. I don't think it hurts us to remember the pit that God brought us out of. Because we've faced the fiery serpents before. We've dealt with with the scorpions before scorpions do what what's their main thing sting what is the sting in the bible the sting of death and the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law we've all had to deal with that one way or the other either worrying about our own death or mourning the death of somebody else it hurts all the same and god has brought us through that Knowing that those people that we mourned by God's grace are where we're going one of these days. Don't ever forget God's word. Psalm 21, turn there. Days like this is what I dread. From here down, I'm freezing to death. And up here, hot as a firecracker. Psalm 21, verse 8. Notice what God said. Thine hand shall find out all thine enemies. What's he referring to? What's in God's hand? The Bible, his book. So you want to know what's against you? Read your Bible. What's against you may not be a big deal for me. What's a big deal for me may not be anything to you. You read it for yourself. You study it. You learn it. Memorize some of it. Thine hand shall find out all thine enemies. Thy right hand shall find out those that hate thee. Did that not happen this week in a Free Will Baptist Church in Ada, Oklahoma? That man and his wife Pretending, the article I read said that while he was in Mexico, he sent his wife some nice bracelet he found there or something like that, necklace or something like that. And she posted it on Facebook. Oh, it's just so good to know he loves me. The day before she killed him. She posted that. He's posting like, I can't remember what it was, but it's something spiritual. He's bragging about something spiritual. And I'm going, that man, mm. thy right hand shall find out those that hate thee. What did God say? Be sure your sin will find you out. Thou shalt make them as a fiery oven in the time of thine anger. The Lord shall swallow them up in his wrath and the fire shall devour them. This is what fiery darts will do. This is what fiery darts did to a pastor and his wife. In Ada, Oklahoma. This is what the fiery dart did to another pastor that I, that I admired, that I knew, that I looked up to. As some great spiritual holy man. Who had been having affairs for years. Nobody knew it. Until his church caught him. And they told him, don't even come by the church. We got your stuff in boxes. We don't want you on our property anymore. Caught him at the hotel. Instead of repenting, this man left his wife, his adult children, grandchildren, to follow after this woman. Gave up probably 40 years in the ministry he gave up, walked out on. God will swallow him up in his wrath. And the fire shall devour them. Their fruit shalt thou destroy from the earth and their seed from among the children of men. This is what fiery darts will do. And who allows Satan to shoot them? God does. To those who hold on to their faith. 
we can still stand when those fiery darts come. But to those who forsake the blessings and the warnings from this book, God will not play games with them. Daniel chapter 3, we know this story. These three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Did you, was you watching Pastor Mike online the other day when I found what I found in the Catholic Bible, the book of Daniel? I knew Daniel 3, chapter 3 in the Catholic Bible had more verses in it than the King James. Because I, I was interested to see what Daniel 3.25 said in the Catholic Bible. By the way, in the Catholic Bible it says the Son of God. Not a son of the gods. But I went looking for that part in the Catholic Bible and I couldn't find it in verse 25. They had moved it way down. They put in a bunch of verses in there. You know what they said, Chris? They added in there that... They added some real long prayer that Meshach supposedly prayed. Then they added some real long song that all three of them sang. And then the Catholic Bible said that the fire wasn't even on them, that they were surrounded by like a bubble of wind and dew that protected them from the fire. And I'm going, that is not what happened. They were in the fire. It wasn't a gas bubble that kept them from burning. It was the Son of God being with them. Amen. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, Did we not cast three men and bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose. Walking in the midst of the fire and they have no hurt and the form of the fourth is like the son of God. Where are they? Your King James says they're in the midst of the fire, not in the midst of a gas bubble. Now, what does this pertain to? Turn to first Peter. Folks, if you love your church, you love your pastor, you love the people of this church, pray for them. You don't know what, some, what somebody in our church may be dealing with right now. Right now. I know a couple of things with some people. Not anything like I just told you about. But certain people have confided certain things in me. I don't hold it against them. I love them just the same. I pray for them. But you never know what somebody might be dealing with next Sunday, next Wednesday night. You never know what could happen to somebody throughout this week. How the fiery darts just keep coming and they just keep coming and you just, after a while, you just can't take it anymore. You just never know. So pray for people in your church. Pray for your church. You know, something, hap something like that happened here. If we weren't, if we didn't have such an online presence... It would be known and forgotten by the rest of the world. But we're reaching around the world. We already had a list of people that love us and people that hate us. And people that would love to see this place destroyed. Pray for your brothers and sisters. Pray for your pastor. Pray for your church. Because what they went through, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that's all of us. And I've preached this many times, but I think it is so, it's such, what's the word, applicable? It applies to where we're living and how we're living right now. Uh, look at 1 Peter 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I've said this many times before. When I die, I want to know that I'm going to heaven. I want to know it. And I thought about that pastor who came home from a mission trip to Mexico and got killed by his lover because that's how deep the sin had gotten. Got killed by his wife and his lover. I don't want to go and not know where I'm going. I don't know that I can tell you where this man is. Maybe God had mercy on him on his way back. I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. But I want to have a lively hope. And I want to be able to instill a lively hope in everybody that I speak to. You can know where you're going. To an inheritance incorruptible, verse 4, and undefiled. And that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Who are kept by the power of God through faith. There's our shield. Kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So, you could say that salvation does take two. It takes the power of God and the faith of the, of the believer. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. But it takes both a powerful God and a faithful warrior. Wherein you re greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. That's where we are. We will be tempted. We will be tried. We will be... Devils will torment us. They will rattle our cage. They will make us afraid. They will shoot their arrows in us and cause us... Like what happened to me the other day. Just boom. Just fear instantly. Anxiety showing up. Have no idea where that came from. Verse 7. That the trial of your faith... And your faith is going to be tried. The trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth. Though it be tried with fire. Might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Brother Sterling, if I could mention you for a minute. I know he's watching. That man had his fiery trial. Seven weeks in a hospital. Not knowing whether he was going to live or die. And to the point to where he felt like giving up. Maybe you've been there. I've been there. We prayed. God, it, it just seemed like, boom, God blessed that man. And even for a while, I mean, he was getting better. And then, boom, he started going downhill. They sent him home preparing to die. And here he was in church last Sunday. God did that. God did that to a man that has chosen to be faithful. Chosen to be faithful. The trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes. When you are like that, all the money in the world... Can't change how you feel and what you're going through. So having that kind of faith and that kind of trust means more to me than all the tea in China, all the gold in the world. It means more to me than anything in this world. Having that knowledge that I know God's in charge. And then turn to chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. 
Let me read a few verses, starting in verse 1. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. How true is that? Man, when you're suffering, sin's the last thing on your mind. So maybe sometimes when you're ill or you are depressed or you're just whatever, maybe God's just keeping you away from stuff you should be away from to begin with. Maybe that's God's way of doing it that day. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of, of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, all of us, lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot speaking evil of you. They wonder why you don't party with them anymore. You say, listen, I, God cleaned me up. I don't do that stuff no more and I don't want to do that stuff no more. Amen. Then he says, now in verse 12, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. If you listen to Joel Osteen and Joyce Myers, they will teach you that if you have bad days or you have trials or you have temptations or you are sick or you're overtaken by sin, that it's your own fault. You shouldn't have you should have thought positive things. You should have said positive things. You should speak positive things to the world and the world has to do what you say. If you listen to that garbage, then when bad days come, you're going to think that that's strange because of what you were taught by those people. But if you read your Bible and understand that as our Savior suffered, so we suffer. And we are suffering and will suffer in this lifetime. And will it get worse? Probably. But he said, Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice, inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. That's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The Son of God appeared with them in that fiery furnace. And in that fiery furnace is going to be us one day. That day is coming. And I think, this is just my theory here. But I think when God kicks all those angels or those devils out of heaven. And lets all those devils up out of hell I think that's going to be a fiery trial now some say oh no we're raptured before then maybe so but what if we're not would you be able to endure the serpents and the scorpions but rejoice in as much as your partakers of Christ's sufferings that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. But let, listen to this now. Let none of you suffer as a murderer, as a thief, as an evildoer, as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And God is doing that right now. That Free Will Baptist Church in Ada more than likely is not the only church this last week in America that had a scandal. It's more than likely that every week some church somewhere in this country scandalous events take place. More than likely. Because the devil's number one target is the house of God, 
the people of God, and God's judgment first is always going to be us. Before, before he takes care of Joe Biden, he's going to deal with us. And it's only right and fair. Amen? It would be hypocritical for God to judge the world of its sin and not correct his own children for theirs. Let's pray. Father, my heart aches. I grieve over what has happened. Maybe this hits home because I just, I know some people in that area. And it's quite possible I might have known some of the people in that church. But Father, it hurts, it bothers me. And I know things like this are going to happen and they're going to happen more and more. God, I beg you. Please, God, don't let it happen here. Don't let it happen with me. Don't let it happen with anybody in this church. God, deal with us. Deal with us harshly if you have to. Chasten us, Father, if you must. But, Father, take care of us. Guard us and shield us as we go through these fiery trials. Help us, dear God, to be shielded from those fiery darts. Help us to be standing strong like Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, who knew the consequences for standing for truth and standing for right and standing for you, yet were willing to face those consequences. Father, help your people to stand strong in these days. Help the weakest one among us, whoever that may be, Help them to be strong like you are. Help your people today. Father, I pray for this church. I pray for that Ada church. I pray, dear God, Lord, you'd send revival. Send a strong pastor to help them through this time. Father, I'm, I'm hoping, God, that they spent today on the altar. And that, God, you've heard their prayers. Father, would you help them? And help all of us, Father, to stand true, remain faithful to you. Put our faith on trial. Test us. Teach us how to fight. We ask for your grace in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.